Hello third graders. Today we're going to be reading chapter 14 and chapter 15 of The Miraculous Journey of Edward Tooling. I thought you might enjoy having a special guest, so we have a guest that you will recognize who's going to be reading with us today. Simba! Simba is here and he is ready to read with us today, third graders. Chapter 14. At first, the others thought that Edward was a great good joke. A rabbit? The men said laughing. Let's chop him up and put him in the pot. Or when Bull sat with Edward carefully balanced on his knee, one of them would call out, Get yourself a dolly, Bull! Edward, of course, felt a surge of anger at being referred to as a dolly. But Bull never got angry. He simply sat with Edward on his knees and said nothing. Soon, the men became accustomed to Edward, and the word of his existence spread. So it was then that Bull and Lucy stepped up to a campfire in another town, another state, another place entirely. The men knew Edward and were glad to see him. Malone, they shouted in unison. And Edward felt a warm rush of pleasure at being recognized, at being known. Whatever it was that, be that had begun in Nellie's kitchen, Edward's new and strange ability to sit very still and concentrate on what, um, whatever it was that had begun in Nellie's kitchen, Edward's new and strange ability to sit very still and concentrate the whole of his being on the stories of another became invaluable around the men's campfire. Look at Malone! said the man named Jack one evening. He's listening to every single word. Certainly, said Bull, of course he is. Later that night, Jack came and sat next to Bull and asked if he could borrow the rabbit. Bull handed Edward over and Jack sat with Edward upon his knee. He whispered in Edward's ear. Helen, Jack said, and Jack Jr. and Taffy, she's the ever been to North Carolina? It's a pretty state. And that's where they are. Helen, Jack Jr., Taffy. You remember their names, okay, Malone? After this, wherever Bull and Lucy and Edward went, some person would take Edwards aside and whisper the names of his children in Edward's ear. Betty, Ted, Nancy, William, Jimmy, Eileen, Skipper, Faith. Edward knew what it was like to say over and over again the names of those that you have left behind. He knew that it was what it was like to miss someone, and so he listened. And in his listening, his heart opened wide and then wider still. The rabbit stayed lost with Lucy and Bull for a long time. Almost seven years passed, and in that time, Edward became an excellent, excellent wanderer. Happy to be on the road, Restless when he was still, the thought of the wheels on the train tracks became a music that soothed him. He could have ridden the, trails, the rails forever, but one night in a railroad yard in Memphis, as Bull and Lucy slept in an empty freight car and Edward kept watch, trouble arrived. A man entered the freight car and shone a flashlight in Bull's face and then kicked him awake. You bum, he said, you dirty bum. I'm sick of you guys sleeping everywhere. This is not a motel. Bull sat up slowly. Lucy started to bark. Shut up, said the man, and delivered a swift kick to Lucy's side that made her yelp in surprise. All his life, Edward had known that he was what he was. A rabbit made of china. A rabbit with bendable arms and legs and ears. He was bendable, though. Only if he was in the hands of another. He could not move himself. And he had never regretted this more deeply than he did that night when he and Bull and Lucy were discovered in that empty rail car. Edward wanted to be able to defend Lucy, but he could do nothing. He could only lie there and wait. Say something, said the man to Bull. Bull put up his hands in the air and he said, we're lost. Lost. I bet you're lost. And then the man said, what's this? And he shone the light 
on Edward. That's Malone, said Bull. What? said the man. He poked at Edward with his toe of his boot. Things are out of control. Things are out of hand. Not on my watch. Not, sir. Not when I'm in charge. The train suddenly lurched into motion. No, sir, the man said again. He looked down at Edward. No free rides for rabbits. He turned and flung open the door of the rail car. And then he turned back. And with one swift kick, he sent Edward sailing out into the darkness. The rabbit, fl the rabbit flew through. The rabbit flew through the late spring air. From far behind him, he heard Lucy's anguished howl. Ooh, ooh, she cried. Edward landed with the most alarming thump, and then. He trembled and tumbled and trembled down a long, dirty hill. When he finally stopped moving, he was on his back, staring up at the night sky. The world was silent. He could not hear Lucy. He could not hear the train. Edward looked up at the stars. He started to say the names of the constellations, but then he stopped. Bull, his heart said. Lucy. How many times, Edward wondered, would he have to leave without getting the chance to say goodbye? A lone cricket started up a song. Edward listened. Something deep inside him ached. He wished that he could cry. It's the end of chapter 14. Chapter 15. I thought you might enjoy having another special guest. He thinks this is a chew toy, and he really, really wants it, but it's not. It's a squishy! This belongs in our classroom. You can't hurt it. Chapter 15. In the morning, the sun rose and the cricket song gave way to the bird song. And the old woman came walking down the road and tripped right over Edward. Humph, she said. She pushed at Edward with her fishing pole. Looks like a rabbit, she said. She put down her basket and bent and stared at Edward. Only he ain't real. She stood back up. Hmm, she said again. She rubbed her back. What I say is, there's a use for everything, and everything has its use. That's what I say. Edward didn't care what she said. The terrible ache he had felt the night before had gone away, and he had been replaced with a different feeling, one of hollowness and despair. Pick me up or don't pick me up, the rabbit thought. It makes no difference to me. The old lady picked him up. She bent him double and put him in her basket, which smelled of weeds and fish. And then she kept walking, swinging the basket and singing. Nobody knows the troubles I've seen. Edward, in spite of himself, listened. I've seen troubles too, he thought. You bet I have. And apparently they aren't over yet. Edward was right. His troubles were not over. The old woman found a use for him. She hung him from a pole in her vegetable garden. She nailed his ears to a wooden pole and spread his arms out as if he were flying and attached his paws to the pole by, a wrapping, by wrapping pieces of wire around them. In addition to Edward, pie tins hung from the pole. They clinked and clinked and shone in the morning sun. Ain't a doubt in my mind that you can scare them off, old lady said. Scare who off? Edward wondered. Birds, he soon discovered. Crows. They came flying at him, crying and screeching, wheeling over his head, diving at his ears. Go on, said the woman. She clapped her hands. You gotta act ferocious. Come on, Clyde. Clyde? Edward felt a weariness. So intense, wash over him. Clyde, Edward felt, a weariness so intense wash over him that he thought he might actually be able to sigh aloud. <sighs> Would the world never tire of calling him by the wrong name? The old woman clapped her hands again. Get to work, Clyde, she said. Scare off them birds. And then she walked away from him, out of the garden and towards her small house. The birds were 
insistent. They flew around his head. They tugged at the loose threads on his sweater. One large crow in particular would not leave that rabbit alone. He perched on the pole and screamed a dark message in Edward's left ear. Ka, 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 without ceasing. As the sun rose higher and shone meaner and brighter, Edward became somewhat dazed. He mistook the large crow for Pellegrina. Go ahead, he thought. Turn me into a warthog if you want. I don't care. I'm done with caring. Ka, ka, said Pellegrina, the crow. Finally, the sun set and the birds flew away. Edward hung by his ears and looked up at the night sky. He saw the stars, but for the first time in his life, he looked at them and felt no comfort. Instead, he felt mocked. Here's that picture. We were down there alone. The stars seemed to stay, stare at him. And we are up here in our constellations together. I've been loved, Edward told the stars. So, said the stars. What difference does that make when you're alone now? Edward could think of no answer to that question. Equally, the light, the sky lightened and the stars disappeared, one by one. The birds returned and the old woman came back to the garden. She brought a boy with her. That's the end of chapter 15. Third graders, I'm going to show you the picture for chapter 16 so you can make predictions before you get to read it. I wonder why that last line is important. She brought a boy with her. Okay, I'll see you guys later. Goodbye.